97.3 ESPN presents The Sports Bash with Mike Hill. It's time for Football at Four with 97.3 ESPN.com's Andrew DiCecco. Powered by InsideTheBirds.com. He's in! Touchdown! Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, it's Football at Four. All right, Football at Four, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Andrew DeCecco is with us today. Check out his latest at 97.3ESPN.com. He's got 10 Eagles that might get squeezed because of the condensed rosters. We'll get into that and more. Let's bring him in at A. DeCecco NFL on Twitter, and he joins us now on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. All right, DeCecco, what's going on, man? <laughs> A lot in the NFL world. How you doing, Mike? It never slows down, and the Eagles, I guess, uh, always jump right to the top of the line. We've been hearing about it for a while. It's not like this came out of right field, but they announced mm-hmm. today that they have signed Jason Peters. I guess the part that maybe jumped out of right field is they weren't shy about it. They they announced him as a guard right away. Yeah, that's kind of what I expected uh, the Eagles to do here when they brought in Jason Peters because, you know, you don't want to kind of undermine Andre Dillard's confidence, uh, right? So, But I do think that there's – listen, we heard a lot of talk even before Brandon Brooks got hurt about Jason Peters potentially returning to Philadelphia. So I do think that, you know, having him there, you know, give the Eagles a crutch, and that's kind of what they're thinking, you know, should Andre Dillard, you know, struggle or falter in any way – Hey, you know, you got Jason Peters there to fill in, and you have a guy in Matt Pryor who they've showed confidence in, you know, to this point. Um, they can step in there. Right now, Matt Pryor is going to probably step in and be that swing tackle, which he's probably best suited to play at this stage of his career. But, um, you know, based on what I've seen, you know, in those limited snaps that he's had, he, he, he has starting ability as well. So the, the Jason Peters signing also adds a lot of depth to an offensive line that really didn't have any. So, you know, we kind of talked about how the offensive line took a hit. Um, and they weren't really they weren't really considered among the best, despite you know what we've heard. But now they're they're right back up there among the best in the NFL. All right, so let me get your opinion on this then. Jason Peters is he back to play right guard or left guard? What's the better fit for him? A guy who's played left tackle primarily his entire career, very very few of any reps at guard. So is he back to play left guard next to Dillard, or is he back to play right guard to replace Brandon Brooks? What say you? In my opinion, I think they're going to keep him at right guard and have him just play between, you know, Jason Kelsey and Lane Johnson. Keep him on that right side rather than, you know, shift Isaac Sayamalu and put him on the right, and you have Jason Peters playing out of position. You know, if you look at what Jeff Stoughton's done over the course of his Eagles tenure, he doesn't tend, he doesn't like to have a ton of moving parts in the offensive line. Tries to, it really, you know, kind of affects the continuity, and he tends to stray away from that. So I think that you know, to the least impact the offensive line, I think that you he'd be best served to kind of slide right in there at right tackle and uh, and right go from there. Yeah, yeah, right guard. We all know how brutal it is to switch sides and change from tackle to guard, so here's a crazy scenario. Is it possible that Jason Peter struggles at right guard and that Matt Pryor actually wins the job? Yeah, you know, anything's possible, Hunter. In fact, you know, it's it's far from a guarantee that Jason Peters just steps right in there and is a uh, – you know, and, and dominates from the guard position. You know, he's never played that before. He, he's only played on the right side. I believe it was 10 games. Uh, his second season, he played right tackle. Um, so this is a this is obviously, you know, um, unfamiliar territory for Jason Peters. So he's going to probably have his struggle. You know, you're playing um, playing from the outside at tackle versus playing on the inside. On the inside, you're playing it. You're essentially playing at a phone booth. It's a, it's a lot different. So you kind of got to got to get acclimated to that. He doesn't have a ton of time to do that. Um, I think if they're going to bet on Jason Peters, you know, being that veteran, you know, being the, the you know, being that he's a nine-time Pro Bowl and six-time All-Pro, uh, I think that, um, and you saw that he still had something left. I mean, for take pro football focus for what it's worth, but he had an 82.4 uh, overall grade. So he's still playing at a high level. So I think that they're kind of rolling the dice and thinking that he should kind of, you know, adjust seamlessly. At age 38, do you think that he can handle those defensive tackles compared to the edge rushers? It's going to be a, it's going to be a different challenge because you're noticing you know across the NFL you saw what happened you saw the contract that Chris Jones got Aaron Donald of course Fletcher Cox you're seeing all these different types of uh, defensive linemen uh, particularly on the interior that are 
that are really, you know, start they they get a lot of pressure up the middle and they're, and they're strong and then they have a lot of, you know, a lot of quickness in Aaron Donald's case. So it's a lot different than, you know, handling yourself on the edge versus, uh, you know, versus a uh, defense end. So it's a lot, it's going to be a lot to take on for, for, like you said, for a 38 year old player, um, it's, it's a different technique. You know, like I said, you're playing in a phone booth and a lot of these defensive linemen play with excellent leverage uh, on defensive tackles. So um, it's going to be uh, completely, you know, unfamiliar territory for JP. Yeah, we had Trey Thomas on about a month ago, and he talked about that very thing was, hey, if he was getting beat up as a tackle, his body is going to take even more of a pounding on the inside. You're going against guys who could be 50, 60 pounds heavier, you know, as a tackle right. uh, as opposed to an end. So that's going to be something that he's going to have to adjust to. Trey Thomas also talked about a right-handed stance versus the left-handed stance, and that's a big change. So let's just not assume that Peters is going to come in here. He also talked about how the right guard on the road is a big factor. He makes a lot of the calls. That's something I think Peters – uh, we'll probably be able to kind of, uh, you know, do. But I want to ask you about the deal they got him for. I mean, a three a three million dollar deal could go up to six. I mean, it seems that the Eagles kind of got their cake and they could eat it too. I mean, they got him in on a steal for a guy of Peter's capability. Yeah, they did, and I think when you compare him to uh, compare the compare the contract to what was uh, what else was out there, the Larry Warfords and um, and players of that mold, I, I think it. You know, you get the you get a like like you said, they got they had their cake and they were able to eat it too. They got a player that they've a player that they're they're they know very well. He can, he's still playing at a high level and um and the contract's very favorable for the Eagles. So I, I think that, that was a that was a great job bringing him in and a, pretty much a no brainer. We we've all kind of discussed the prospects of him coming back and thought that that was a possibility. It's a little bit earlier than I thought he would be back, but you know it, it worked out for the Eagles. Not to mention, I guess they have a backup plan in the event that. Uh, Dillard struggles, then they can move Peters right back over to left tackle and then plug Matt Pryor in at that guard spot. So it kind of kills a couple birds with one stone. Yeah, I really do think that, you know, the bringing back Jason Peters had something to do with, with Andre Dillard. You know, maybe something that they're not fully sold on or or they just want to, you know, rather than, you know, just give him free reign to, you know, hold that position down for the entire season. You, you really, you, there is nobody else on the roster before they re-signed Jason Peters that could step in and play left tackle um, at a high level. So I think having him there gives them that. Not only does it provide a lot of depth, but you're, you're, you're getting a guy who, who, who's still playing at a high level um, at, at the left tackle spot. So I, I think it had a little bit, obviously, the, you know, they came right out and they said, you know, listen, he's a right guard. But, you know, ha- there's something that tells me that, you know, they, they like having him there as a fallback plan at left tackle. So the Eagles make that move today. They bring Jason Peters back. It's a one-year deal. Now, Peters did say, according to Adam Schefter, that he's 38. He wants to play until he's 40. You wonder, Mm -hmm. what if he plays well? And then what? You know, you go through this whole rigmarole again next year. Oh, do you bring Peters back? Uh, Does he play, you know, right guard? Do you have to move him again? Because if Brandon Brooks comes back and and Peters is playing right guard, he would have to almost find a new position again next year if he played well this season. Why wouldn't you bring him back? You would almost wonder. Yeah, and you know, you look at the contract. You know, next year it's going to be even more favorable if he does want to play and he stay and he plays at a, a, a to his capabilities and and stays health, relatively healthy. I don't. I, I do think that playing on the interior on the offensive line is going to have a little bit more wear and tear on his body, particularly in his advanced age. But um, if he plays at a, if he plays to his ability and and is willing to come back for another year under similar terms, I, I think that that would be a no brainer. Where do you rate this current offensive line compared to the rest of the league? Hmm. Well, um, before today's signing, um, I wasn't super high on their prospects. I thought that, you know, you have a question. There was a big question mark there in Matt Pryor. And more importantly, the depth behind him was very questionable at best. Um, but right now, I, I guess I would have to put him. I would have to put him probably in the top 10. I mean, um, Isaac Sayamalu is the weak link of the, of the group. He's, he's played well in spurts, but hey, he has struggled um, in pass protection, and that's something to keep an eye on. But I, I think that, that that moves the needle and pushes them into the, you know, the top 10 category. Uh, by the way, Pro Football Focus just ranked their offensive lines and had them at 
number 10. So that was before they brought Jason Peters back. So one of the reasons is they really like Andre Dillard as a pass blocker, uh, and they like Matt Pryor uh, as a right guard as well. So they had him slipping from the number one at the end of 2019, dropped him down to number 10th, entering the 2020 mm-hmm. season. I wonder if they'll make a quick amendment on that since it was uh, just a couple of days ago. I want to get your take. Uh, there was a poll at The Athletic that asked agents about the GMs. They asked who was the smartest GM in the league, and the winner was one Howie Roseman. Do you think Mm -hmm. Roseman gets enough respect from the Eagles fans? No, I don't. Um, You know, fans are sometimes prisoners of the moment, and when they're – when. You know, when the team's not doing well or when a young player is plugged in and they're not playing to the capabilities, they, they want instant results. They want, you know, let's, we've got to go sign somebody. We've got to do this. Well, it, it doesn't necessarily work that way. If you look at the body of work that Howie Roseman has done, he's brought in, you know, veterans on, on you know, reasonable contracts that have stepped in and played well. You look at Patrick Robinson. Um, Ronald Darby played well in spurts uh, all, all across the board, and especially in that 2017 season. And he's found some undrafted players and, um, and he's, and he's, you know, you look at what he did this offseason. He got uh, Javon Hargrave and um, and Darius Slay. He's done. He's done. He's made the moves necessary to kind of help the Eagles move the needle and make them, you know, a significant contender. Um, sometimes his moves aren't, you know, the, the results aren't instantaneous, which is what a lot of fans tend to, you know, gra- you know, really harp on. But I mean, I think he's done a great job, you know, um, over his over his tenure. It's no secret that I would say his big knock is drafting. People are not happy with all of the picks that he has made. But how good do you think he is when it comes to talent evaluating? See, I look at it as, yeah, he might have the last say at times, but it seems like Doug Peterson and Jeffrey Lurie and Howie Roseman all kind of work together to make these type of picks. Right. Yeah, I think it's a collaborative effort too, Hunter, you know, especially when, you know, when you're looking at deciding the 53-man roster. The one knock on Howie, I will say, is, is has been the draft, um, the draft aspect of his job. You know, he, he, there's been a, there's been a lot of whiffs in there. There's been some picks he certainly would like to have back. Um, there were some head scratchers this year, but you know, it, it, let's let's see how it plays out. You know, before before you know, you know, writing it, writing this draft off as you know um, questionable or another you know lost you know lost opportunity. But um, I think it is a collaborative effort when they when they do their um, final decisions on who makes the roster. But yeah, the one thing that I would say that Howie really, uh, I think that fans really like to, they look at when when they when they think when they don't put him up there with the top GMs in the NFL is they, they look at his draft history and it has and when you look at it some of the picks are a little bit painful but um, but you know overall I think he's done a pretty good job. Uh, we're talking with Andrew DeCheco, football for powered by the Inside the Birds podcast here on the Sports Bash ninety seven three ESPN. Uh, I want to go to – now, you wrote an article today about 10 players that could be affected by the condensed roster, and this is the thought yeah. that the NFL could trim rosters from 90 to 75. And there's some names on this list that popped out to me. Now, the ones that I think that popped out to me the most, one was Mike Warren. We talked a little bit about him, uh, but at that running back position, because – I figure Warren as a running back, and to some extent Adrian Killens as well, they would be in kind mm-hmm. of a competition with, let's say, like Corey Clement? Yeah, they would probably be in competition with Corey Clement. And if you listen to what Adam Kaplan said on the Inside the Birds podcast, I guess within the last month or so, he mentioned how the Eagles wanted to get a long look at Elijah Holyfield. So when I'm looking up and down the roster at potential guys that – might get squeezed if they have to trim the rosters. I think that he would be one of them. I don't necessarily know if he can carry five. And, you know, I'm also, I was also taking into account that they could potentially sign a veteran um, this summer to, and to kind of round out that group. Um, there's going to be, there's some intriguing guys that I think may find themselves on the outside looking in if they have to, if they're forced to, you know, trim it down 10 to 15 guys. Um, we, we talked about Mike Warren. I spoke about him on that. I was very high on his, I am still very high on his prospects. Um, I spoke about him on the show a couple months ago. Um, and then you look at, uh, Deontay Burnett, he's a bottom of the roster guy, but he, he's a guy that's still only 22 years old. He was kind of thrust in there at the last game of the season. It would have been nice to see what he could do. I think Rob Davis is going to be okay. Uh, as far as I don't think he'll get trimmed right away. If you look at the roster, they don't have anybody. You know, Alshon Jeffrey is going to start the season on the PUP list, so likely. So uh, the only other X on the roster is J.J. Arcega-Whiteside, 
besides Robert Davis. So I think that that kind of gives him a fighting chance. Um, but then, you know, I mean, Shelton Gibson, this is probably going to be the last season for him. He, it just hasn't worked out for him. He's got the speed, but he hasn't been able to kind of carry over his special teams performance over to the offensive side of the ball. Um, yeah. And then you look at Dante Olsen, you know, an FCS, uh, standout 397 tackles at Montana, you know, Montana's all time leader in tackles, Brown of at the combine. That's the reason why he didn't get drafted. Um, but he, he, he has the he, he kind of reminds me of a uh, I don't know if you guys remember in the early 2000s that the Eagles had a player named Jason Short who was a special teams madman and um, he kind of has that same he kind of reminds me of that so I think he can step right in and play special teams and make an impact there right away so there's some guys here that I think could help the team but we'll never know because they may find themselves you know. Um, on the outside looking yeah, in. Yeah, Olsen's a guy that I like. I uh, would love to get a chance to see him in some preseason games, uh, which probably won't happen either. The other guy on that list that I was a little surprised by was uh, Joe Osman, who they really mm-hmm. liked last year, and it seemed like they were almost creating a position for him, and then he tore his ACL, and you wonder if now, you know, missing a whole year, and he was kind of a, you know, um, a, a wild card to begin with, if, if this uh, condensed roster just kind of pushes him out of their plans. Yeah, Joe Osman's been a favorite of mine, you know, since 2018. He's, he's undersized, but he plays with a relentless motor. Uh, he's an effort guy. He's terrific in the, in the meetings and, and on the practice field. He gives the, the, the starting defense, the starting, um, starting units uh, a good look. And he was, he, he was, he was going to make the team, you know, by all accounts, he, he had the roster made, you know, they, they really, they're moving him in like a joker type of role where they can kind of move him around and to take advantage of his pass rush acumen. But, you know, they, then he tore his ACL at the open practice and he kind of became an afterthought and they traded for Jannard Avery, a fourth round pick for Jannard Avery. So now that kind of, that, that's kind of signal to me, you know, that, that is the Osman role. Um, they're not, they're, Jannard Avery is going to be a part of this team moving forward. Um, but now it's it's kind of where does Joe Osman fit? Um, he, he's not gonna he's not sitting above Sharif Miller on the depth chart. He's not certainly not sitting above Josh Sweat. Uh, Deshaun Hall's coming off the ACL, so he's not really going to be a factor. But if you're going to trim somewhere, it's going to probably be somebody who's you know sixth or seventh on the depth chart. And right now, that's Joe Osman. Speaking of defensive ends, I can't get Derek Barnett out of my mind when thinking about this defense. And I asked Mosher something similar yesterday. I would like to get your opinion on it. If he's just average moving forward, do you think his time is running out here? Or do you think average is good enough for Derek Barnett here in Philly? Yeah, I heard Mosh kind of equate that to uh, Brandon Graham, you know, who's kind of, you know, made a living off of, you know, he's never had the double digit numbers and sacks and he's always had, hovered around nine, nine and a half on his, on his, on his best seasons. And, um, but I think it's a different type of player than Derek Barnett. I think Brandon Graham's very, uh, he impacts the, he affects the running game. Um, he does certain he does certain things. There are certain aspects of his game that I think really helps the defense. Whereas Derek Barnett can be a non-factor against the run. He's had some bonehead penalties, you know, some unnecessary roughness penalties. Couple that with his with his injuries, and you know, I, I do think the time's kind of running out on a player like that. You know, you kind of hear rumors of you know potential to Javian Clowney and all these different types of you know potential additions, and you don't really have those. Obviously, you don't hear that kind of chatter if you're if you're happy with your first round pick of 2017. So I do think that if it doesn't come out, if it doesn't come together this season for Derek Barnett, you know, you turn the sundial over and it's starting to <laughs> his time's starting to run down. <laughs> yeah, he's been a tough guy to kind of uh, uh, put a put a finger on at this point because he's been hurt so much, and when he's played, it's not like he's jumped off the page. Uh, but he hasn't been terrible either. I mean, he hasn't been a bust. It just hasn't been a uh, you know a pro bowl a pro bowler either. He's just kind of been there. But we'll see. This could be a very big year for him. What about you? Listed about ten guys who are um, you know undrafted guys who maybe would have had a shot, but because of the condensed rosters. What about veterans? Are there any of the guys um, that are veteran players that? having this weird training camp and possibly no preseason games could squeeze them out. Uh, I think when you get a player like potentially a Rasul Douglas, who's going to have a, he has an uphill battle to make the roster. I mean, you know, you look at some of the, some of the back end guys, it's still a veteran, like a Rudy Ford, who is a special teams dynamo. Um, and they, they acquired him last season for his special teams uh, performance, but I don't know how he really how he fits into their plans without a potentially without a preseason. 
You know, he's he's kind of a one-dimensional player. He doesn't really factor in on defense um, over his career with the Arizona Cardinals. He didn't really factor in on defense. So I went immediately when that comes to mind, possibly a Jatavis Brown, um, you know, the linebacker who they acquired from the uh, in free agency who was formerly with the uh, with the Chargers. You know, if you don't get enough like a long look at a guy like that who does have some injury histories. Um, I think you're going to, you would look to move forward with, you know, you, obviously you have your, your draft picks, you have Nathan Gary, you have TJ Edwards. So I'm really high on his prospects this season. Um, you know, he could be, a, he could, he'd be another veteran that kind of springs to mind. Funny. Uh, they just did this over at ESPN.com and the guy they listed that could be in trouble was Russell Douglas. And some of the other guys, I guess Corey Clement was one I threw in there. Hassan Ridgeway. He's a five-year guy who uh, there's a lot of competition at that defensive tackle spot. So, uh, yeah, I, I like I like Ridgeway to stay to stick as the four, but I think that they may end up keeping five given the injury history that they've had at the position. Um, you look at a guy like Raekwon Williams. You notice I didn't put him on that list. I think he should be safe because I think if you get a long look at a guy like that, he could play his way onto the roster. But I do agree with you there on Corey Clement. He's far from a lock. Yeah, and they got a lot of interesting running backs in here. Uh, talk with Andrew DeCecco, Football of Four, of course, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Um, and uh, we'll leave you with this. The Eagles or the city of Philadelphia announced today that no fans will be allowed in attendance the entire season uh, until February 2021. There'll be no large gatherings, so no mm-hmm. Phillies games and no Eagles games. Um, I, I mean, it, the NFL, they have that competitive balance rule, right? So if the Eagles can't have fans, would that then mm-hmm. say that other teams also can't have fans? Yeah, I mean, that's that's something that's very interesting. Because if you remember Adam talking about the equity rule, you know, everything has to be, you know, even playing field. And how can you have the Eagles that have no fans and you go you go on the road someplace and, and they have, you know, they're sitting at, you know, 40% capacity. That, that's just not, that, that's not, you know, can you imagine, you know, what Jeffrey Lurie would be, there would be an up, he'd be in an uproar. So um, I, I think that it's going to be ultimately what we kind of, we kind of feared, you know, all along that there may not be any fans, that there won't be any fans in the, in the NFL stadiums. Yeah, that's the way it looks. Uh, we'll see what that equity rule. I know Adam brought that up on our show during Football of Four. Uh, we'll have to take a deeper look what that means. Hey, they can have 25% if you have zero, or they can have 10% if you have zero, or you have zero, they have to have zero. That's something we'll have to do a little research on. Andrew DeCecco at A. DeCecco NFL. For more, go to 97.3 ESPN. Dot com. All right, Andrew, we'll talk to you Friday. All right, guys, take care. And he, like all guests, appeared via the Boardwalk Honda hotline.